just a quick break in the action then to summarize where we're at so far. So that we can compile a little bit of a list here of some of the magnetic systems that we have. The first systems that we have here, of course, is a wire with a current I in it. Just a wire carrying current in there. We have a result. Mu not I over 2 pi d. I is the current that the wire carries. D is the distance from the wire. So we have a result of the magnitude. Hopefully you also have a bit of a picture in your head about how this looks. The wire can be carrying a current, say, in a direction like that. And hopefully with a right-hand rule, you can determine that if I put my thumb in the direction of current and point into the page like that. So all these magnetic fields, I would point into the page in the top and be coming out of the page in the bottom like that. And likewise, uh, there's another sort of perspective of wires that you really need to have that the currents may be coming straight out at us like that. When we put our thumb in the direction of the wire, the magnetic field will sort of be circular like this where the magnetic field will point in the direction of these arrows here sort of as dictated by the right-hand rule. So I want to be very clear that the magnetic field doesn't move, it doesn't actually circulate, it's just that if you were curious about the direction of the magnetic field at any given point, the right-hand rule will sort of tell you it points in generally a counterclockwise direction at any point tangential to the circle that's a distance d from the wire. So that's sort of the way that works for the, the wire. Um, in the second case we have here, now we have a ring of current, don't we? We just got the results here. Sometimes you can also call this just the loop of current. And what we have determined here is that the magnetic field, due to the loop of current, is mu naught i r squared over 2 times the quantity r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power, something like that. We have a result. And the parameters that are involved in this equation here, of course, r here is the radius of the loop here. i, of course, is the current in the loop here. And x here is the distance from the loop or from the ring. So you can just plug all those parameters in and get the result. The picture, of course, we get from this in the formal picture of the derivation looks something like this. You can sort of plant your loop like this and imagine the current traveling down it like that. We've sort of determined what the magnetic field would be like at a point this distance x away from the loop. And if you go back to the derivation, I realize that maybe I use z for this variable here, but it doesn't really matter. It's just that this variable here is the distance from the loop. Uh, along the axis of the loop. That's very important as well. And so what we get is we get a magnetic field that's going to point somewhere like this. It would be sort of a B pointing away from the loop, and the strength would be given by that equation. So there's a freebie we can get out of this as well to actually add a third item to this list here. What about at the center of the loop? The center of the loop like that. We can get by just sort of putting here x equal to zero from this equation right here, because that's how we shrink to the center. We take this observation point and pull it all the way to the center of the loop like that. Well, we get a result that looks like this. We'll get a mu naught i over r squared and divided by two. Now what we have in the bottom here, that if x is zero, we'll get an r squared to the three halves power, which just gives us an r cubed, right? And now we can do a bit of cancellation here and get that b is mu naught i over two r. So we get a result here for the magnet field at the center of a loop, the center of it. It looks remarkably like the one due to the wire, but there's no pi in there, so don't get them confused. But they do look similar like that, but they are not. And so what this tells us then, if we take a, a loop like this, a loop, and maybe we have some current going, traveling it like that, it's the magnet field right there at the center. Okay, so we're not going to travel, like the loop, of course, has an axis like this, but we're not going to travel out on that axis at all. We're going to get the magnet field right there at the center, and there's the strength of it right there. And if you want to determine the magnitude of the magnetic field, you can use the right-hand rule once again. Fingertips in the direction of the current traveling around the loop like that. There's your fingertips. The magnetic field will point sort of up away along the direction of your thumb like that. So you can always determine the magnetic field in that manner. So in this case here, the little loop will have a magnetic field that would point straight over like that. This is an important result for us, which we'll talk about in class when we meet again here, because if you have these little loops like this, with current I traveling and then make these little magnetic fields like this as they sort of exist anywhere in space. A little B like that, a little B like that, or if it's over here like that, the current's up like that, a little B like that. And I'm getting all these Bs by visualizing the right-hand rule. There's the current magnetic field, current magnetic field, current magnetic field. And the reason why these are important here, because these systems here look like a little atoms or the dipoles that we hypothesize are going to exist in that metal refrigerator. Remember, these are a big player in why magnets 
stick to refrigerators, so we'll get there. So hopefully you can have these in your mind here, and these are the systems you'll see in the homework.